Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining once again. Uh, a new webinar in this series, Foresight series. This one is on uh, internationalization. Not that it's a new subject, uh, but the reason I um, chose to talk about it again today, uh, even though I've done webinars already on the subject, I've written about it, extensively, I should say, in the past, is that uh, this dimension of higher education is likely to change yet again, perhaps drastically, in the next future. Um, of course, what we all know now is how internationalization, and in this case, specifically student mobility, international student mobility, was affected by the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we know it was uh, actually uh, in the higher education sector the first significant casualty of the pandemic. Uh, the fact that international students could no longer travel to countries where uh, they had planned to study. Uh, the fact that it caused significant, huge, sometimes financial uh, losses for countless universities, in particular across uh, North America and some European countries. Uh, we know that it generated a, a, an awakening of sorts for many institutions uh, when they realized to what extent they had become dependent on revenue from international enrollments. The word addiction actually popped up frequently in articles on the subject uh, starting a few months into the pandemic. But I'm not here today to address the, the direct impact uh, of the pandemic on student mobility. That's already pretty much a thing of the past, as I'll show in a minute. What I do want to talk about is what seems to be slowly emerging as a long-term trend. Well, one part of it not so slow, already facing us, the other perhaps slower, perhaps not. Um, some of it probably accelerated by the pandemic, nevertheless, whose seeds clearly existed before. For example, in a moment, I'll develop uh, a little bit on the uh, decrease of international of student mobility toward the US. Uh, and I wanna just uh, mention the fact that the American Council uh, on education has documented that as far back as five years ago already, in other words, well before the onset of the pandemic, more than half of American colleges and universities were already decelerating their internationalization efforts. Uh, the way that things look right now, the main factor likely to affect the future of internationalization in higher education is the increased that's the immediate factor, the increased geopolitical uncertainty uh, that has emerged. First, as a result of the growing tension between the US, more broadly, the West and China. And then, of course, more recently, as a result of Russia's war in Ukraine. Uh, another emerging trend that looks less significant right now with less, let's say, early warning signals but that may turn out to be a game changer nevertheless in just a few years uh, is the growing concern with climate change. So what I'll do is first uh, briefly give you a picture of how student mobility is faring post COVID that'll set the global context. And then I'll go to the most visible factor likely to affect uh, internationalization in the next few years is already an ongoing saga virtually, the geopolitical tensions. And then I'll conclude with a few, just a few notes on the concern over climate change, which again is only barely emerging in higher education at this moment. I'm going to, uh, Loic, I can share my screen, right? Okay, I'll show you my slides. 
uh, that one is not the first one. Okay. All right, so this is my outline, okay? Uh, first, student mobility post-COVID. Uh, regarding the pandemic, it's, I think it's worth wondering at this point if it's even had more than a time-limited impact on mobility. Uh, for all the predictions that I'm sure you remember early into the pandemic, that the, the uh, massive worldwide switch to online would be the way of the post-pandemic future, that higher education would never be the same again, that face-to-face uh, -face would uh, virtually disappear except for a, a niche activity. For all of these predictions, uh, we can see already a, a rebound. Some destination countries are already rebounding. Uh, the international education landscape looks again, at least right now, more competitive than ever. Uh, international education destination countries are again eager to attract uh, uh, masses of international students, which now often translates into uh, measures to speed up uh, student visa processing, for example, or uh, providing more flexibility with work visas, uh, strive to improve students' experiences abroad, uh, and a number of other changes that really were not there before the pandemic. Um, having said that, some trends, uh, even in this traditional landscape that seems to have returned, are changing. For example, Australia is now ahead of the US and the UK in the demand from most Asian countries with the exception of China and India. I'll say that, uh, I'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, other than China and India, Australia is becoming the des second destination after Canada for that region and is now ahead of the US and the UK. Uh, while survey shows that, surveys shows that China and India, students from China and India still prefer the UK and the US as target study uh, destinations. But that's definitely a change. Whether it's long lasting or not, we don't know, but that's what we can observe right now. More broadly, a, a survey uh, conducted by IDP, which is an international higher education organization, last summer across 94 countries uh, among students, students either considering to take a course program, any course program, or already taking a course program, shows that physical mobility remains the preferred option for students. Uh, with, as you can see, over 60% of students uh, uh, saying that they had no interest in fully remote uh, study. If they were to, in other words, if they were to enroll at a, uh, at a university overseas, uh, they wouldn't do it uh, in, in fully online mode. Uh, that's what this means. 96% uh, saying that they prefer uh, fully on-campus learning, with 75% saying, okay, not their uh, preferred option, but they wouldn't object to hybrid learning, but in the host country, not at home. And there are other studies showing similar uh, results. So we can definitely see that no, COVID hasn't killed the taste for mobility in students, nor has it reduced the value of face-to-face -face, uh, learning and teaching uh, on campus in the eyes of most students. Confirming these findings further, uh, other studies shows that conversely, international students enrolled at international branch campuses of foreign universities tend to be less satisfied with academic and teaching quality and with the academic environment than those enrolled at home campuses of the, at the home campuses of those universities. Nothing surprising there, uh, really. For example, a study called uh, Making the Grade, I think I have it there, well, not very visible, uh, but it's a large study. It's called Making the Grade, Do International Grant Campuses and their home campuses differ in international student satisfaction with the academic experience. 
not a really short uh, uh, title that can easily be memorized. But anyway, the article was published in September, last September, in the Journal of Studies uh, uh, in International Education. Uh, what the, the researchers did is compare satisfaction levels of students studying at branch campuses uh, locally and at home campuses of the same universities. The study doesn't uh, reveal the names of the universities that it has surveyed, uh, because I suppose the universities ask them not to. But the, the study indicates that uh, the universities surveyed here are all in the UK or in Australia, and that their branch campuses are situated in Asia, including mainly Malaysia, Singapore, and China. And what emerges uh, from this study is clearly that when it comes to studying at a foreign university, students prefer by far going to the university's country over studying at its branch campus locally. Uh, the latter remains the second choice for a variety of reasons, uh, but often because of financial constraints and other reasons. Uh, this is an important finding considering that branch campuses in the last decade have been increasingly seen by leading universities in the West as a way to bring in additional revenue. There are about 300 uh, branch campuses worldwide at present. And uh, also given the fact that universities are banking on this solution for the future. So this may raise a question as to the future potential of branch campuses uh, around the world is really uh, all that uh, uh, some leading universities uh, uh, hope, hope it to be right now. In general, uh, therefore, we can see that student mobility is rebounding, uh, perhaps even with a vengeance uh, after COVID, um, but that key destinations are perhaps shifting with what is clearly a diminished desirability of the US. There are many different reasons that explain that. Uh, the Trump years legacy, uh, the increased polarization of American society and politics, a sort of degraded image worldwide. Uh, and perhaps even more significantly, if you look at uh, studies and surveys, according to uh, a number of them anyway, the fact that potential international students no longer feel that it is entirely safe to live in the US uh, with the ever increasing, what seems to be ever increasing episodes of, of shootings, in particular in educational institutions. Uh, more of a factor seeming to affect internationalization at this time, geopolitical uncertainty. Okay, so I'm going moving on to my second part. Uh, geopolitical uncertainty, it's not an entirely new factor. It's more complex now, but it started a few years ago with the rising tension between the US and China, uh, which has already significantly affected academic research collaboration between the two countries. The Trump administration had put in place uh, drastic measures to curtail US-China research projects. The Biden administration has reversed some of the most stringent uh, restrictions on scientific cooperation with China and with other countries that the US sees as posing challenges to its national security or uh, uh, regarding espionage or human rights. But American universities are still concerned that this is not enough and that collab, in other words, that the Biden administration is not doing enough, is not undoing enough of the Trump uh, legacy and that collaboration with international researchers uh, remains difficult because of the uh, bureaucracy, the costly bureaucracy uh, that it still requires. Uh, universities see no major easing in scientific disclosure requirements, for example, the requirements that American scientists report uh, their overseas connections to the federal government. Uh, and they see no significant easing uh, either in general in anti-foreigner suspicions, uh, let's call it uh, that, on the part of the federal government. One example, the MIT uh, has established 
its own policy about scientific collaboration with China, of course, within existing federal rules and regulations, because the MIT says federal officials can be trusted. Uh, many American institutions are not particularly worried that they won't be able to attract valuable scientists from abroad, especially from China. Not just because of the generalized uh, uh, climate of suspicion that prevails now in American uh, academia, but also because the US is fast becoming an unattractive destination for Chinese scientists. And this is quite, this has been going on as I pointed out for a few years already, but this is quite a spectacular change from what this situation was even just 10 years ago or even less than that. Looking ahead, I'll mention uh, a foresight study by the Swedish Foundation for International Cooperation in Research and Higher Education. Uh, foresight study is called Foresight 2030, the role of academic internationalization in the next decade. Paradoxically, now this is a whole committee of advisors and higher education specialists that came together to produce this foresight report. Paradoxically, the first thing that they pointed out when the uh, report was released, it's paradoxical for a study with a 10 year horizon, uh, is that the authors said outright that they have no ability to predict uh, the future. And that if they had to do the same study five years ago, they would have produced a very different uh, document. This tells you uh, something about the, the geopolitical uncertainty, which is, of course, what they're referring to here, uh, that we are uh, uh, living in uh, now. Uh, as it is, the study did predict the outbreak, to, uh, the outbreak of conflict in Ukraine, even though it was finished before at the beginning of the war. Uh, it predicted the fact that this would intensify the refugee crisis in Europe that this would disrupt education and research collaboration with Russia. Um, and the study also develops uh, high risk scenarios showing the potential that there will be less international activity in the future. Uh, the study underscores the need for universities to continue, that's a little bit on the advocacy side, to continue to promote science diplomacy and academic collaborations uh, because they build ties and in particular to build ties between democratic and non-democratic countries. And this they believe should go on despite the, the fraught geopolitical landscape where we now live, uh, in which they say uh, after the isolation and immobility fostered by the pandemic, uh, we can observe that current uh, uh, geopolitical tensions are producing a level of instability not seen in 30 years. That's what the study says. With globalization challenged by nationalism, with a return to great power competition, uh, and with the, this is another interesting salient point, the pursuit of, the pursuit of truth giving way to differences in perception. This is how the report puts it. The others points out that the, the international activities developed by universities do influence larger uh, geopolitical relations, which is why they encourage universities to continue uh, coll the collaboration path between democratic and non-democratic countries. Uh, they also predict that with uh, this is another on another subject, but it's also interesting. They predict that with demo de uh, demography de declining in Asia and exploding in Africa, it is likely that in the coming decade, Asia will supply less international students and institutions that seek to foster mobility will focus greater attention on the African continent. One of the high risk scenarios uh, uh, that the study put forth, puts forth highlights the rising threat, sometimes they say existential, to science and the scientific process, with some autocratic countries clamping down on higher education, including on research. Uh, they predict that the increased polarization of geopolitics will first 
uh, destabilize current international education activities uh, and relationships, and then later on, accelerate new ones. Uh, one key question for higher education uh, internationalization is, the report talks about it, but multiple articles are now raising this point as well, is the question of whether the tide of globalization is really turning. Uh, as tensions rise between the West on one hand, China and Russia on the other, and after two years of uh, pandemic that Western government uh, viewed as an eye opener, uh, really on the risks of excessive uh, economic dependence on imports, mainly of consumer goods and mainly from China. Uh, the, the, a, the question is raised now uh, of whether globalization has reached a peak and whether we're not embarking now on a deglobalization path. Uh, if that is, uh, if this, Re this results uh, uh, indeed, if this is, uh, sorry, the path that we are indeed uh, embarking on, uh, if uh, globalization does turn out to have passed its peak, uh, then this fact will have profound implications for many universities, which have been writing essentially the tide of globalization both in student enrollments and in research for well over the past 20 years, okay? So this is a significant uh, possibility and one that is well worth taking into account, thinking about. Uh, to find out whether this was likely uh, or the level of probability of this, the Times Higher Education surveyed some 100 uh, university leaders worldwide about their view on globalization and the free exchange of scientific knowledge. And the result is somewhat opposite to the scenarios of the Swedish uh, Foundation for International Cooperation in Research and Higher Education. In the time, uh, Times Higher Education, you can see the results here uh, survey, the 52% the said that they thought their institution would actually increase international student recruitment over the next 10 years. That includes all European leaders that were uh, surveyed with some reservations for the UK because of the after effects of Brexit. Uh, well, 66% said that their, their institution was likely to deliver more of its courses as transnational education. Transnational education is essentially branch campuses uh, over the next 10 years. And so if you connect that with previous findings about uh, branch campuses, transnational education, that's a rather uh, interesting point also to think about uh, and perhaps discuss. Uh, the largest concentration in this category, uh, in the uh, transnational education category, was among university leaders in Asia and in Australia. And finally, 93% of respondents said that cross-border research collaborations should continue uh, developing despite global geopolitical tensions. So this is the only res result that corroborates uh, the, the, not so much the findings, but the uh, position of the uh, Swedish Foundation for International Cooperation in Research and Higher Education. So what we can see from this data is that on one hand, geopolitical tensions are making it increasingly difficult to carry out uh, international collaboration uh, to form partnerships with certain regions of the world, uh, that it is already creating some shifts in student mobility, of which we don't know whether they're going to be long term or not. And that on the other hand, universities remain committed to undertake that effort over the next uh, decade perhaps uh, because it'll still be possible, or perhaps they don't realize yet how difficult uh, this is going to be. Um, finally, an indication that in the same manner, and this is my transition to my last part, which as I said, will be brief, so I'm almost finished, just to reassure you. Uh, in the same manner, uh, an indication perhaps that many or most university leaders uh, may not have yet absorbed 
how global warming will impact internationalization at their institution is that in the same uh, Times Higher Education study, only 16%, it's not on the slide, only 16% of leaders surveyed said they believe that their university's internationalization ambitions were in conflict with its environmental, uh, environmental goals. Uh, so an overwhelming majority seeing no contradiction between continued or even expanded internationalization strategy over the next 10 years and uh, complying with uh, or, or uh, making a, a, a significant uh, commitment to uh, environmental, to more uh, greener, more environment friendly uh, policies. Uh, which, which leads me to my last shorter segment, uh, how climate change may impact higher uh, education internationalization. Uh, some observers of the higher education market are already predicting that climate change of all the possible changes likely to affect the sector over the next de decade, that climate change will be the one, the one with the strongest impact. Uh, I, I have to say, looking across the professional literature, this is not yet very visible. I can say there's a ton of articles on the subject, but if there is one factor and one factor only, if we should single out only one factor that is likely to change the equation, it will undoubtedly be the extent to which the, the fear of the consequences of climate change uh, and the huge level of activism in this regard are becoming prevalent among young people already today uh, and among students of pre-university age, among high school uh, students, even more. Uh, the demand on the part of, uh, of future students for universities to comply with climate change requirements and to go green uh, in a growing range of activities and governance policies will probably be the number one driver of change. And you can already uh, see that uh, developing. We can already see still essentially in the US and Europe for now, how students are challenging traditional education mobility programs uh, because they argue that, that it increases carbon emissions uh, and are already calling for a drastic change. A number of organizations are already trying to pressure the higher education sector to implement quick environmental uh, changes, the most prominent of which is probably the Climate Action Network for International Educators, C-A-N-I-E. Uh, it's a large group that is striving for carbon neutral and climate literate international ed education sector by 2030. And it is undertaking vast lobbying, educational and training activities that target institutions, educators and students alike. Uh, to conclude again, data regarding climate action at university level is still sparse for now uh, in the professional uh, literature. It certainly doesn't look yet like a massive movement, but it's very likely that the climate issue will become one of the, the key issues, if not, again, the key issue that colleges and universities will have to grapple with in the very near future, as demonstrated by the fact that some university rankings are now including the record of universities in terms of renewable energy and other policies, a, uh, policies aimed at curbing global warming, uh, because this is increasingly becoming a key uh, standard, a key criterion among potential students for selecting an institution. So if it's only because of that, and if it's only under student pressure, uh, very, it is very likely that uh, universities will have to adapt uh, very quickly uh, to this new landscape and uh, these students' uh, demands if they want to remain uh, relevant over the next few years. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank you for uh, uh, being there still.